Chrysler with Cuba and classified. successfully to this crisis. After debating how to respond with his advisors, Kennedy ordered the U.S. Navy to blockade Cuba. He was then able to negotiate with Soviet President Khrushchev and peacefully instigate the removal of the missiles on October 28, 1962. The idea is to Cuba through the invasion. So what area is the most anti-Castro? Well, we can land in Trinidad, which is the closest to Castro since it's its power. The location would also allow the A-2506 to uh, join the other rebels and seek shelter in the mountains. How do we know this is part of a revolution? Well, we don't. But hopefully there are enough Cubans who hate Castro and Trinidad that will join the exiles' cause. We also have to take out the Air Force. We could send a squadron in the 1960s to take out the Air bases. But we'll have to disguise the plan and hide U.S. involvement in all of this. So, are we going to use American forces in this invasion? No, we have a force of 1,500 Cuban exiles who are training in Florida right now. However, we will have the U.S. Navy in the game. What is the backup plan if fighting on the beach and fails? There will be no backup plan. Failure is not an option. What if the Cubans... No, it's the Cuban that surrendered and cast for The Cuban that has surrendered and cast for so be it. This morning, the New York Times reported they found leaked information about a plan to invade Cuba. The CIA is apparently working with the Kennedy administration to overthrow Fidel Castro. They also reported that 1,500 Cuban exiles are undergoing training in Florida. The Times also believe that the airstrike on the Cuban Air Force base on April 15th was part of the plan. The airstrike was disguised as a mission that Cuban defectors performed before leaving Cuba, but now reporters have discovered President Kennedy's hand in the mission. So hopefully this invasion will spark a revolution in Cuba that will ultimately lead to Castro's death. I don't like the plan. It is no longer a secret that Castro himself probably already knows about it. Mr. President, I advise you not to approve of that. But the Cuban exiles have already begun their training. What are we going to do with 1,500 upset Cubans who are ready for war? Can we just tell them that we cancel the invasion and let them lose on Central and South America? No, that would be irresponsible. Yes, we have to go through with the invasion. But we must play down the U.S. involvement, which means canceling the airstrike on the beach. But then it's a suicide mission. I know, but we're too far into this plan to back out now. Mr. President, this plan is doomed for failure. No, we can pull it off. But Mr. President, Mr. Rust, you will be silent. I will approve this plan. But Mr. Bissell, one thing. Yes. Move the landing site. We have to play down the U.S. hand in this. You have three days to find a new spot. You do our best. Well, what is the Kennedy? Enough for him to approve the mission. Did he change anything? He called off the air support during the invasion. What? Did you explain the consequences to him? No, I didn't. He also wants the location change. To where? He didn't say, hey, no, I didn't extreme the strategy and efforts of Trinidad to him. We'll just have to put a new location. All the matters is that he was in his. Alright. I knew we were misleading the president, but we had to go through with the mission. The whole operation, however, was doomed for failure. To start, we only had 1,500 soldiers in Brigade 2506. Castro had about 20,000 troops. The landing point of the invasion was moved from Trinidad to the Bay of Pigs. Most of the Cubans living in the Bay of Pigs were sympathetic to Castro. Uh, the bay was also 90 miles from the mountains, so the troops couldn't regroup with the revolutionaries there. But the biggest problem with the Bay of Pigs operation was that Castro himself knew the exact time and place of the invasion. The CIA knew that he knew, but we still went through with the invasion. As a result, the operation has been titled by many to be the perfect failure. It was early on April 17th when my company landed on the blue sector of the beach. Once I stepped ashore, I knew it was going to be hell. I myself was promised by the CIA that the skies would be ours, that no Castro's planes would be in the air. But when I turned back to look at the ship I come on, one of Castro's planes hit it and blew the ship up. But I didn't have no time to worry about the skies, because Castro's force opened fire on us and we hit the curve. 
The Americans only resupplied us with five drops that day. That was it. We were left with what little ammunition we had to stop. So after 72 hours of fighting, we surrendered to Castro and were thrown in prison. The Americans betrayed us. After this absolute fiasco, I guess Castro felt pressure to something, and he asked Khrushchev for missiles. So by October of the next year, the Americans had yet another problem to deal with. General Taylor, Mr. McNamara, to call this session in light of recent covert discoveries in Cuba. Yesterday, the CIA revealed U 2 spy photographs of missiles in Cuba. They informed me that these are Soviet MRBM missiles, identical to ones seen in the Soviet Union during Eisenhower's administration. Unfortunately, the CIA does not know whether these missiles are operational. Are they nuclear missiles? Well, the pictures do not reveal any more hints of orbit storage sites, but there could be other sites that do contain more hints. And we must act immediately. If we don't carefully think this through, we could find ourselves in another world war, or we do not find another fiasco with the Bay of Pigs. I've already authorized more reconnaissance with people for further analysis of the problem. Mr. Ross, I've already explained the situation to you. Would you please explain your ideas concerning the situation to McNamara and Taylor? Well, two obvious options would either be airstrikes in all of the major bases in Cuba or an all out invasion. We must consider all out options in depth, however, before we come to any conclusions to prevent a second day of pigs. Before we decide on a proper course of action, we must continue surveillance of Cuban activity. Mr. President, I also urge you to contact Castro through his ambassador and warn him that Khrushchev is victimizing him and his nation. We could possibly convince him to send the missiles back to Khrushchev. I will only negotiate with the Soviets. The Cuban government is secondary in this matter, and we'll probably not return the missiles. At this time, I would advise limited airstrikes as well as a naval blockade to force the Soviets into peaceful negotiation. However, I do not want to make any final decisions if we have more further reconnaissance. I agree with Russ. We should carry out air raids and an invasion. My brother strongly advised against air raids because the large amount of Soviet and Cuban casualties could destroy any hopes for peaceful negotiation. I would also advise against air strikes because the risk is too great. A blockade would be your best chance for peaceful, for peaceful resolution of this conflict. It would force Khrushchev. Yes, yes, I heard you before. But my brother is also strongly against the blockade. He believes the blockade will eventually fail and could plunge us into a naval war with the Soviets. We would have to worry about Soviet planes and submarines attacking the U.S. That is, if the Soviets plan on attacking us. It seems that in order to choose a proper course of action, we should see if Castro's intentions are for a political move or a military response. We should thus end this section and meet again after we have received more intelligence from the CIA. Agreed. We finished that October 16th meeting and did not meet again until the 18th when the CIA returned with more intelligence. The new intelligence I received from the CIA does not look good. These photographs show new and larger missiles, which the CIA believes are IRBM missiles. These missiles have a much greater range than the MRBM missiles and could reach most of the continental U.S. Given the new information, we should consider nothing short of a full invasion as practical military action. Airstrikes were not sufficient to save the missiles. This is not a military problem we're dealing with it. It's a political problem. Problem of properly conditioning Khrushchev for our future moves. Well, if it's a political problem, then General Taylor's plan for a blockade will probably be more effective. Yes, I agree. As do I. If we strike them unannounced, the Soviets could attack U.S. forces in Berlin, or who knows where. Peaceful diplomacy is the only solution to this problem. By October 23rd, 1962, after much debate with my advisors, chiefs of staff, and cabinet, we worked out a plan to quarantine Cuba with the naval blockade, which forced the USSR in to commence negotiations with the US. On the 28th of October, President Khrushchev peacefully agreed to remove the missiles from Cuba as long as I promised never to invade Cuba again, thus achieving diplomatic success. From October 16th to October 28th, we literally looked down the gun barrel into nuclear war. We had caused the problem, though in a rushed and poorly planned operation to invade Cuba, which ended in total disaster. After Castro obtained missiles from Khrushchev, we had to slow down and debate how to respond to this situation with proper diplomacy. We were on the verge of nuclear holocaust, but we successfully had the missiles removed. It was luck that, pre that prevented the war, but we won. This crisis added more tension to the Cold War, and afterward, the Soviet Union and the United States tested and developed more nuclear weaponry. This crisis was the most stressful time during my career as Secretary of Defense. If there is one thing I learned from the crisis, 
it would be that the indefinite combination of human fallibility and nuclear missiles will lead to the destruction of nations. But to avoid such destruction, nation must, nations must attempt to negotiate peacefully with one another. 